I was thinking about how developing this sort of hive mind would help us to facilitate a revolution if that becomes let's not kid ourselves it's totally already necessary hey it's luminosic in this video we're going to dive deep into the subject of psychedelics and the occult we're doubling down on taboos we're going to go way down the rabbit hole these are two subjects that i think are inextricably intertwined and they have a lot in common they're widely uh, social taboos and i think very uh, misunderstood there's a lot of superstition, especially surrounding the occult and a lot of misunderstanding. A lot of people, when you think of the occult, they're going to think of like satanic rituals, guys in cloaks, bats flying around, and you know, even more morbid things. And <clears throat> you should just get that right out of your mind. Occult actually just means hidden. Uh, in, in astronomy, if there's an object blocking another object, they say that it's occulted. It's from the Latin occultare, which means to hide. It's a verb. Last night, I actually had some really huge epiphanies in terms of how much the conscious revolution movement can benefit from a better understanding and a more disciplined approach to integrating this knowledge into our beings. So hit the like button, share, subscribe, please do support us on Patreon. In my experience, psychedelics help us to access the latent capacities of mind that allow us to engage in these occult faculties. And to me, with my understanding of consciousness as a unified field that permeates all of existence, it's really just a reference to these capacities of mind that we don't normally engage with. And I think we're at a tipping point in human history where people are starting to rediscover that these are actually natural functions of the human consciousness. And I think there's actually a lot of utility to learning how to access and also to master these things to bend them to our will. I think one of the reasons that magic and the occult has been so discredited is that people almost unfailingly expect too much. Magic is not meant to circumvent natural law. It is meant to develop a more sophisticated understanding so you can integrate natural law into the systems that you create and into your own being in a way that allows you to live in a way that is more effective and truer to the nature of your being. So you, you do not attempt to do anything that's impossible. It is said that the magician does not try to work with ingredients that are not in his cauldron. So if you are trying to use consciousness to influence some event to occur, um, say you're going to write a book, you don't just expect the book to manifest, you constrain spirits such as printers and get the necessary magical weapons like you know a computer and uh, printing presses, and you constrain them to do your will. Uh, the knowledge that, that consciousness has capacities that extend beyond what most people in the modern age believe are engaged. But the basic processes and the mechanisms through which events occur are still the same, regardless of whether you're doing them with or without uh, magic as an element in your practices. The organizing principle in the universe is consciousness. There is an increasing number of physicists even that believe that consciousness had to have somehow preceded order. That without consciousness, energy only exists in a chaotic form. Within several schools of mysticism, it's found the idea that a thought or the sudden acquisition by pure nothingness of self-awareness was the event that catalyzed creation. This thought, which in Hebrew is eheye, which means I am, the word, or the Logos, was a vibration that rushed forth and contained the blueprints of the universe. You may have seen the intricate patterns that form in sand that's been placed on a thin sheet of metal that sound or frequency is directed at, and it reveals these extremely intricate and different geometrical forms as a macrocosm of the microcosm in the same way that this self-awareness allowed the Creator to influence the universe in order to manifest this creation as we attain to higher levels of consciousness as the microcosm of the macrocosm our ability to influence our reality like a mini god of our own world increases dramatically psychedelic and occult practices are excellent tools to help accelerate our development reports of experiences with telepathy precognition and other experiences that we might file under the heading occult are very common with psilocybin ayahuasca and of course this gives the skeptic kind of grounds to say well you're high on a psychedelic so you're just imagining that these things happen um, but the reality is that there have been clinical studies that have been done with astounding results 
There are reports of this throughout the anthropological record. I've experienced it. I know countless other people that have experienced it. And a great magician once said, the mystery always presents itself in a way that casts doubt upon itself. And so this kind of manifestation of something like DMT actually putting people into contact with interdimensional beings is something that would be a very good example of the mystery presenting itself in a way that casts doubt upon itself. When I was a member of the Hermetic Fraternity, the Stella Matutina, or the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, my mentors uh, definitely advised against mixing occult practices with psychedelic drugs because it's sort of like opening a valve a little bit when you're in your normal um, state of consciousness and with psychedelics, it's like you're just spinning the valve wide open and there's the possibility that you become overwhelmed um, too much too soon and you don't yet have the capacity to navigate the territory. There are all sorts of different reasons why there are warnings in regard to this. Despite the warnings from the hermetic fraternities, this is exactly what the shaman does. The number of correlations found amongst shamanic practices and Western occult traditions is actually pretty surprising, from drugs to drumming and meditation. Some type of practice leading to an altered state is pretty much ubiquitous throughout all of the magical traditions of the world. The association with psychedelics in the mysteries goes back thousands of years to the Kaikion in the Greek mysteries that Plato and Socrates were both known to have partaken in. It's suspected that this drink contains some sort of psychedelic plant. Also, in the Vedas, a drink called Soma is mentioned that likely as well contained a psychoactive plant. And to this day, when a Freemason is buried, acacia leaves are sprinkled on his grave, the acacia being sacred to the Freemasons. I don't think it's a coincidence that this tree contains DMT. There are a number of other surprising similarities. For example, in the Western occult tradition, the magician will cast a protect protective circle around him which represents his microcosm or his personal universe that he wants to control the energies and determine what will come into the circle and what will remain outside of his circle in the same way the shaman in a medicine ceremony and also in many other spiritual ceremonies, the circle serves the same purpose and the shaman's job is to expel the energies that do not serve the people inside of the circle and to protect them from external and potentially malevolent influences. In the Masonic tradition, there are two pillars, the pillar of light and the pillar of darkness, Yaqin and Boaz. They represent a number of different things, masculine, feminine, dark and light, good and evil. And the magician is said to stand between the two pillars, attempting to harmonize all of these forces and energies. There are coca chewing Indian tribes that have exactly the same metaphor except that coca leaves are used to represent the two pillars and the magician standing in the middle. Likewise, in the jungle of Borneo and elsewhere, uh, evil sorcerers said to be turning to the left. And in the Western occult tradition, we say that a dark magician is, has taken the left hand path. So let's talk about channeling a little bit. The magician calls forth non-human intelligences, usually to get some kind of guidance or insight or even to subordinate his own demons to do his will. This sort of practice is of course fundamental to shamanism as well and of course it's very common for people that smoke DMT and drink ayahuasca to have these encounters with these non-human intelligences that are very convincing. As far as the modern practice of channeling is concerned, uh, as it's found for example in the New Age movement, I find 99% of it to be totally unconvincing. There's usually nothing there that really suggests contact with a predator human or a non-human being of a higher order. Although there are some some exceptions, a uh, notable one being the Book of the Law written by Aleister Crowley in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid in 1904. Over a period of three days he allegedly contacted a being that was a solar angel that called itself Iwas and it did dictate to him a number of things that have turned out to be surprisingly accurate. In fact some of the professional skeptics have looked at this particular document, people that have outright dismissed Nostradamus and Edgar Case have said things like interesting but not conclusive because it's very hard to dismiss a lot of what was predicted in that book. I should also mention in passing that um, this being tells Alistair, take wine and strange drugs and know me thereof. Uh, it's important to note the use of the word strange which Alistair took to imply that you should not let these drugs become too familiar otherwise they are no longer strange and there's danger in this. But this does seem possibly like a prediction about the experiences that would become very common uh, 100 years later with the resurgence of popularity of DMT. I think that it's likely as well that a lot of information that is thought to be channeled is just drawn from the collective mind. 
This would include transtemporal information because I suspect that consciousness is omnipresent throughout all of time and space. As far as my own personal experience goes, I have to admit that I have received a lot of information both with the medicine and without that has turned out to be surprisingly accurate. I talk a lot about that in my videos, so I'll relate a personal experience that I have not yet shared. My mother named me after a childhood friend that died when she was a teenager. And the story was that he had died accidentally on a golf course. And during my awakening process, I became convinced that I wasn't being told something. And I wasn't even sure why it mattered, but I decided one day that I would call my mother up and ask her what really happened. And so I got her on the phone and I brought this person up and she was very reluctant. I could tell she wasn't really interested in opening up on this subject. And so a voice in my head suddenly says, ask her about Steve Miller. And so I said, what, 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 what does Steve Miller have to do with this, Mom? And there's silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> and she says, that is the guy that, that is the guy who he walked in on with his girlfriend that drove him to kill himself. And uh, it freaked my mother out so badly that she didn't speak to me for like two weeks. Along those same lines, one of the most ex convincing experiences of telepathy that I've ever had, an a ex-girlfriend of mine was about a mile away on a mountain, and I was going through this very intense part of my process, and she knew every thought that I had, everything that I did for 45 minutes. And the thoughts that were going through my head basically was an imaginary conversation between me and someone else. I mean, there's no way that she could have guessed this stuff. Um, the interesting part about it, considering that I had always, uh, prior to this, thought of telepathy as probably a matter of people reading each other's brain waves, this was over such a long distance that that kind of didn't make sense anymore. Lately I've been thinking about the possibility that maybe quantum entanglement could actually explain this long-range telepathy. But the bullet point of this part of the presentation is that when I asked her how she came to know all of this stuff, she said, they were dictating it to me. I didn't really press the issue and ask her who they were, but it was clear that she was saying that something was narrating everything to her. It's not so much like she had just tuned into my thoughts and was hearing them firsthand, which I thought was very interesting. So the possibility that some spiritual agency can be involved in relaying messages that are somehow relevant uh, between people, um, I think is worthy of consideration. I've already made a video about ayahuasca and telepathy, so uh, in this space I'll just say that uh, the experience of telepathy is so common that the original researchers that were looking at the vine and doing experiments in the late 50s and early 60s actually called the alkaloids in the vine telepamine because this has been documented over hundreds of years and of course I've had lots of experiences uh, with telepathy, particularly with a certain ayahuasca shaman that I work with quite frequently that seems to know everything you're thinking at all times. I've had this experience of short and long range telepathy with a number of people. Um, I've known a number of mind readers that I am absolutely 100% certain can actually do this. There was a psychic associated with the uh, Star Tribe that would regularly just pluck whatever I was thinking about out of my head no matter how random it was and start the conversation from there. Uh, there are street people in Santa Cruz, California, the locals know about this. They will come up to you and just, it's their hustle. Because I guess sometimes they'll do this to someone and the person will decide they're a guru and take them into their mansion and start feeding them and treating them as their teacher. Having experienced this in Santa Cruz, I went into a gas station to buy a drink or something a few minutes later, happened to mention it to the clerk and she said, oh yeah, those guys, only about 15% of them are really good at it. And they told me that it, uh, there was one guy that had taught them all how to just clear their minds. They said it, they call it sacred drinking because you can only have a beer or two to sort of like help to um, clear yourself and relax. And then you're receptive to the thoughts of other people. Um, my current girlfriend and I would ask and answer questions from South America to uh, Virginia while we were separated for a few months and oftentimes the answer would come within a minute or less. I think it's important also to remember that we don't really know exactly what it is that we're dealing with here. Are spirits just consciousness that have sort of like coagulated the same way that an oil will coagulate in water that have maybe no real objective ex existence of their own? This doesn't necessarily negate their capacity to communicate with us or to have a feminine or masculine aspect, but it could be just that the mind is giving them a form and 
putting them into a context that is easier for us to process and understand and communicate with. But since we don't know and we really have no way of knowing, I think that respect for tradition and having some caution when enter in, entering into these spaces is advisable. Having said that though, the direct experience of being part of a collective consciousness I think makes us gentler, more generous. It is part of the Gnosis and it is ex extremely important. All of these other aspects of consciousness that I've talked about in this video can serve to empower us individually and collectively. So I would encourage all of you out there to devise experiments and to really test the boundaries of consciousness. Also, you have to be extremely objective because it's very easy to fall in love with the idea that you're telepathic or to believe some voice in your head is some higher dimensional spirit when in fact it could just be a voice in your head. And it's important to have some objectivity and to question and be skeptical but still leave enough openness to allow for the parameters of your experience to expand. It's important also, I think, to, um, I, I, for example, when I was going through the process and it was really, really intense, I would be very careful and set up like check systems. Objectivity in these processes is extremely important because you don't want to get lost in the mind. There are many mistakes that the magician makes, one of them believing that his magic can do more for him than it can. And I think this is what a lot of the warnings about the occult are actually about. It's not so much that you are messing with unseen forces that you don't understand and that you're going to be punished or that there's some sort of um, spiritual percussion for engaging in these practices. Uh, a, a very simple example is just think about uh, uh, the acquisition of money. If you don't have the self-control, the discipline and willpower to manage the money, to make good decisions, to keep yourself under control, wealth could very easily do you more harm than good. And the same thing goes for precognition, for telepathy. If your ego, for example, is not in balance, to the extent that you're working in the interest in the collective, it's very easy for you to uh, abuse these abilities for personal gain. If you haven't developed the capacity to distinguish between an actual intuition and a wish demon or something that you really desire, you know, you can start to make predictions that are complete nonsense. It's very easy to get lost in your mind. And I think that the warnings about occult practices mostly pertain to that. Also, I think it's important to consider that this stuff doesn't really fall outside of the parameters of what even modern science considers possible. There are definitely schools of physicists that believe that time, you know, everything all happened at once, basically the multiverse theory. So <clears throat> if consciousness is really a field that permeates all of space and time and everything's already happened at once, precognition is not really that hard to understand. And I think the theory put forth by neurobiologists like Dennis McKenna that there are filters in the nervous system that screen and filter out uh, incoming signals from consciousness or perceptions of energy that would distract, overwhelm, or they're just not pragmatic. They're filtered out and when you take these substances, those filters are brought down. And I guess what I'm suggesting is that it's not just perceptions of, you know, uh, geometries um, or lattice works of energy that are suddenly made perceptible by these compounds, uh, we also start to receive the thoughts of others, um, <clears throat> extremely powerful precognitions. I'll give you guys an example of one of the craziest experiences that I've ever had in my entire life. This was about 10 years ago. Uh, we had been invited to meet with a group of Native American spiritual leaders, shamans, medicine men from the Sioux tribe, from the Aztec, Mayan, from all over South America, North America. Um, there were even like some Japanese Zen monk guys there and uh, one of the shaman that was present commanded the wind. He said, may the wind blow to confirm the power of our prayers and instantly a tunnel of wind blew so hard that gravel was blown across the parking lot. Um, lots of very crazy things happened. Eventually I'll make a video telling this whole story. But this is the part I'm going to share here. I, uh, I had this, this book, it was basically an old magical grimoire, and it was uh, a bootleg, so some of the pages were copied badly, and you couldn't quite read the script. So, 
I had some DMT and a pipe in the cupboard behind me. So I opened the cupboard and I remember I left it open and I took the DMT pipe out <clears throat> and I opened the book and I thought you could kind of see like the edges of all these letters and I was only half serious and I thought maybe if I just take a little hit I'll be able to see what's actually written here my mind will just fill in the lines. And so I took a hit of the DMT and instead of that happening this red symbol made it was like made with red lines that were very very like the detail was extraordinary it, it was an incredible sight to behold and honestly it scared the hell out of me uh it kind of looked like a demonic sigil or something so i'm looking at this eventually it disappears and i turn the page and i take another hit of the dmt and i'm looking at this page and everything is blurry except this one line in bold that somehow was copied perfectly and I'm, and, and that line said, the only tool you need is your consciousness. And I'm hating the pipe again, and I'm like, yeah, but what does the rest of it say? And then I realized, you don't need to read anything but the line that says the only tool you need is your consciousness. And as soon as I had that thought, I heard this loud knock come from behind me. And I, for a second, I thought it was like the knock of Satori. They say when you reach that state, there's a knock in the head. And then I realized, no, that came from right behind your head, not in your head. And I turn around and look and the cupboard is now closed and I hear the pitter patter of little feet running away. And I, I thought, man, that was really weird. So the story wouldn't be that remarkable if it wasn't for what happened when we went to meet with these Native Americans. After the ritual with the shaman that commanded the wind, um, after a whole bunch more weirdness of at least we had driven down to Farmington, New Mexico from Durango, Colorado, and I didn't want to drive back, but I didn't bring any money with me, so I couldn't rent a room. And I'm sitting at the uh, around the back of the hotel, and I'm thinking, what should I do? Should we drive all the way home? My girlfriend's already in the car, because she's thinking, we just got to go home. We're not, what are we going to do? Sleep in the car? This is dumb. It's only an hour and 45 minutes. I really didn't want to drive. And so I hear the voice of Chief Golden Light Eagle, who's um, the the Sioux Sundance chief, say, if you need a place to sleep, my room is empty. 331, go upstairs, the door is open. And I thought, I have legit lost my mind. Like, this is just dumb. But after everything I had seen that day and uh, the preceding weeks, I'd been having a lot of these synchronistic experiences and really strange sort of uh, borderline supernatural or paranormal kind of experiences. Um, I was at least prepared to humor this apparently telepathic message from the chief and so i went up to the third floor walked down the hallway and sure enough the door is open to room 331 so <clears throat> i crack the door open i go in and there's like this oil of abermelon i recognized from my association with the hermetic fraternity and uh there was a leaf of some plant that had been broken and sprinkled all over the room some kind of cleansing ritual i would assume so there's like an armoire and I open it up like a cabinet and there is uh, a stack of necklaces, maybe four or five. One of them had these like giant puffed corn. Um, the, the other one had like a fossilized velociraptor claw or something on it. And another one had like a big spear point. And I realized this is definitely Golden Light Eagle's room and his Mayan friend, I think. And, um, I look beside the necklaces and there is a stack of cards with a red cloth covering them. So I pick up the red cloth and on the top of the deck is the exact symbol that I saw form in that old grimoire after hitting the DMT. So I don't know what the explanation is for that. I never actually have spoken yet to Golden Light Eagle about this experience. Um, So, uh, to finish the story, I guess, I, I closed the thing, went out to the car, got my girlfriend, we went in the room, slept, and went downstairs and had breakfast with Golden Light Eagle and the rest of the crew. I should mention at this point that the reason for this uh, convention was that these indigenous people had decided that it was time to tell white people, basically, that the tribes, certain tribes, have always been in contact with the star tribes. Uh, they referred to them, but we would call aliens. And um, that's another subject for another video. Okay, so. And so what is the utility of all this stuff? Um, 
I think one of the most important experiences, or the most important aspects of an experience like telepathy is that it is a direct experience of the unity of our being. That consciousness really is one thing and that our experience of a singular being is an illusion. Uh, one soul divided that union may come. We're here to experience and we are really just one mind. All of nature is one mind. And these occult practices that <clears throat> so often come from journeys with plant medicine and other entheogens help us to see the truth of this. There are also a tremendous number of very powerful ideas in the occult that are very much worthy of our contemplation. The microcosm macrocosm idea is extraordinary. It is an expression of the fact that the one is in the all, the all is in the one. Um, the universe basically is a giant being and we are a miniaturized reflection of that being. Also, there was a guru in the United States that supposedly was ejected from the country for teaching that everything is one thing doing one thing. And this is another expression of that macrocosm, macrocosm idea. The first experience that I had that <clears throat> was an indication that some of these old occult practices might have some validity was gematria and DMT. <clears throat> I became very sick at about the age of 21 and it led to a whole host of problems. Um, I was very tired all the time, sometimes I was in a ton of pain. Uh, so eventually, long story short, we sort of settled on chronic fatigue syndrome, which doesn't really have any treatment as the source of this suffering, but it led to opiate addiction because it was very painful and exhausting. And <clears throat> So one day I bought some DMT at a Tool concert, and I went home and tried it, and I think the second time I smoked it, I realized that my symptoms had just completely disappeared. And... Uh, Maybe a week or so before that, my roommate had discovered gematria, which is the ancient Hebrew practice of adding together the value of different phrases to find relationships, because the Hebrew alphabet, each letter is an image, and it's also a number. And so <clears throat> he had kind of been talking to me about this and trying to convince me that there was something to it, and I thought, well, you know, there's so many words, and it just seems kind of just flaky and ridiculous. Although I did feel that since number is behind everything, the possibility that we had like subconsciously sort of cloaked mathematics with a different form of expression and that the relationship could be uncovered didn't seem impossible. So for some reason, after I smoked this DMT and these symptoms went away, I went into his room and, uh, cause that's where our computer was, and I brought up the Gematria calculator online, which was like a database that every phrase that was entered into it, uh, if you entered in a phrase, it would find other phrases that have the same numerical value. So I punched in anion dimethyltryptamine, I hit return, and uh, the sentence cure for chronic fatigue syndrome was the only phrase in the database with the same numerical value as anion dimethyltryptamine. So that was kind of a stunner. I was watching um, on Netflix a show called Sense8 last night, and <clears throat> I'd been thinking about this a lot already. So it was, it was almost one of those occult moments that we happened to start watching this series that was kind of directly dealing with this topic that I've been kind of hung up on. And, I, uh, and that is this, that in case of a revolution, for example, it would be very difficult to control a telepathic hive with access to the Akashic Record or the Zero Point Field or the Collective Mind, however you want to think about it. If one of us knows martial arts, then all of us knows martial arts. If someone knows how to pick locks, then everyone knows how to pick locks. And in this show, uh, people were smoking DMT and then they were having these experiences where they were basically sharing minds when they needed to. And it reminded me that when I first encountered DMT, I had these experiences with friends of mine that were eerily similar to what happened on this show. I'll give you one example. Um, I had a friend that I was very connected with, 
And one night at 5.30 in the morning, there was like this blue light out of nowhere. It was kind of like sleep paralysis, where you're lifted up out of the bed and sometimes you feel like you're being swung around, which I've had a number of times, but this time it was accompanied by this bright blue light. And I happened while I was being spun around by this blue light to look at the clock and it was 5.30 in the morning and my friend calls me at 7.30 in the morning, two hours later, and she says, what, what the hell happened at 5.30 in the morning last night? <clears throat> And I said, why don't you tell me? And she said, well, this blue light lifted me up off the bed and spun me around. And there was this shaman appeared to her and gave her a message. And that was a little bit different. But the, the point is that we were, a lot of us during this time period, were having these shared experiences. And the impetus for this seemed to be exposure to dimethyltryptamine. So the takeaway from all this, and I, I will expand on this in greater depth in su subsequent videos. But fundamentally, what I'm trying to communicate is that I am 100% convinced that our consciousness has capacities that are not generally accepted in the mainstream, to put it mildly, and that there is great utility in learning to access and master these things. And it is a very difficult and long process. For myself, it was way harder than I expected, and I suffered a great deal when I pierced the veil and kind of went too far too fast. It's taken me a long time to integrate and to develop the discipline and the capacity to start to really seriously consider engaging all of this in a way that is constructive and that I am really in control of the expression of these energies and capacities. I would like to really strongly encourage anyone out there, you know, take it slowly. The lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram is generally in any Western occult fraternity or sorority. It's, it's going to be uh, prescribed to a beginning magician. It's, it's pretty simple to do. And I can tell you from my own experience that I was actually surprised at some of the results that I got that I'm actually not going to share with you because it's best that you discover these things without any preconceptions about what's going to happen. And there's instructional videos on the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram online. Uh, if you're thinking that the pentagram is a satanic symbol, by the way, I should mention that it absolutely is not. The pentagram is a symbol of protection, and it was actually a Christian symbol until, I think, the 6th century. Uh, in the modern esoteric tradition, basically, if the point is pointing up, it's a symbol of the four elements plus spirit, and it's the redintegration of matter in, back into spirit. And if the point is down, that's also not necessarily evil. It just is a symbol of spirit being integrated into matter. So, you know, pentagrams, not evil. The other ritual that I would suggest is the middle pillar. And this basically is just a visualization meditation. Um, I suspect that it may be more than that, but it is at least that. And it involves uh, the vibration of Hebrew names of God in the chakras, basically, or the sephirot of the tree of life, but uh, several of them correspond directly to chakras. So the world is in a tremendous amount of trouble, and I think that what's going on with the popularity of ayahuasca and the other entheogens is that we are being called to expand our consciousness, to realize these occult capacities of mind, to master them so that we can take conscious control of our own evolution, catalyze our consciousness, increase our metaphysical metabolism, but we have to take responsibility. We have to approach these things with respect, with caution, open-mindedness and skepticism but I, I think we have a responsibility as people that are waking up to really put the pedal to the metal and take this thing as far as we can as fast as we can because the hour has grown late the sun is getting hot and I don't think that we have time to procrastinate so so devise experiments with your friends you know if you're taking medicine with people test the telepathy. There's some experiments online that you can find uh, if you don't want to devise your own. But the next step, I think, for the conscious community is to really take these new dimensions of consciousness that we're discovering seriously and constrain them to do our will in the words of the Magi of old. Probably the most interesting part of this experience with this series, though, uh, I think it was during the, the second or third episode, I was thinking about how developing this sort of hive mind would help us to facilitate a revolution if that becomes let's not kid ourselves it's totally already necessary uh all of the characters that were sharing this group mind started to sing that four non blonde song 
about praying for a revolution. Like literally as I'm entering into this headspace where I'm contemplating exactly that. And I think that these experiences actually are an indication of our microcosmic mind coming into harmony with the macroscopic consciousness that underlies all of creation. You have to be willing to let go of an idea and to test your experiences to make sure that they're valid. The swamp is sticky and easy to get lost in. For example, uh, when I was in the thick of it with my group of friends, if I saw something that was questionable, I would not say, do you see that UFO? I would wait and see if someone else acknowledged it first, which is actually I'm drawing from something that, that did in fact happen. But these sort of protections against wishful thinking or wish demons or delusions are very important. So be safe, experiment, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon, and thanks for watching. The records go 